up, which he should have, but he didn't. He said, listen, if I want to sit here and sing a gospel and sing these songs all week long, I'll do it. I'll know when I'm ready to work. Let's go, boys. And he got the boys with him, <laughs> and they all went out the door, got in the car, and went to his house. And you could have, I'd love for you to have seen the faces of all those officials from MGM sitting around. Colonel Parker, the same way, man. He didn't know what to do either. It, it was funny when you think back about it. But allow me to say that the next morning, Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock, he came in, he did not sing a spiritual, and he sang whatever song that we that we was working on. Swing down, sweet cherry stuff, and let me ride. From then on, studio executives let Elvis do things his way, and occasionally even incorporated gospel music into the soundtrack, as was the case in the movie The Trouble with Girls. Girl Ezekiel went down in the middle of the field. He saw an angel working on the chariot wheel. Zeke wasn't so particular about the chariot wheel. Just wanted to see how a chariot wheel. Why don't you swing down to the chariot stop and then we ride? Oh, swing stop and then we ride. Rock me, Lord, rock me, Lord. Elvis was among the world's most famous celebrities, yet he remained enamored with gospel luminaries. As a demonstration of his undying devotion to gospel, he regularly attended the National Quartet Conventions held in Memphis. At the Ellis Auditorium here in Memphis, things like Elvis would attend. We'd have five or six quartets, and then we organized the National Quartet Convention here in Memphis in 1957. I remember those nights when he would come backstage and the electricity, when you, were, you heard he was coming, and then you would wait, and then we would enter the room, and you could just feel the excitement backstage before the people in the audience even knew he was there. When he walked in, it's like, <laughs> it's like royalty came in the room. I mean, he just, everybody stopped. And, and I was just totally in awe because I had never met anybody like him. He always showed up every year. And at, now looking back on it, it's because he wanted to be part of that. That was important to him. It wasn't like he was doing it for anything like uh, promotion. It was, I think he had to be there or, or he had missed something, you know. He'd come on stage and sing, usually Peace in the Valley, and we would back him up. And then finally he told me, he said, uh, from now on, said, just to introduce me, and I'll come out and wave to the audience, said, Colonel Tom doesn't want me performing. <laughs> I never did get to sing with him. He'd tap me on the shoulder and motion me off stage, and he'd sing my part. Everybody there asking me, well, how, how was it uh, singing with, with Elvis? I, I never did get to sing with him in those days, of the statesman days. If we never meet again. On August 14th, 1958, Tragedy struck. Gladys Presley, Elvis's mother, died in a Memphis hospital from a heart attack. Elvis asked the Blackwood Brothers, his mother's favorite gospel group, to sing at the funeral. Elvis, I remember, went over to the casket, kissed his mother, and said, Mama, I'd have every, uh, give every dime I have and go back to digging ditches just to have you back. He was so devoted to his mother. I've never seen anybody more devoted to their mother than Elvis was. Somewhere in heaven By the side Charming roses. The lowest point in his life was when his his, his mother died. Uh, it was it was just he he just he just couldn't believe that she died. And you know the saddest thing now for us when we go down to Graceland, 
walk in that front door and I can still see him sitting on the third step, squalling his eyes out. The sight of heaven, I'll need you on that beautiful show. Soon after his mother's death, his army battalion was called up and shipped out to Germany. He served as any regular soldier, but his financial resources afforded him the opportunity to rent a home off base, where his friends would gather. He often spent his free time listening to his cherished gospel records. These were sounds that reminded him of home and of his mother. He completed his hitch and returned to Memphis in March 1960. At the end of the storm is a golden sky and the sweet silver soul of a lover. In October, Elvis began recording his first full length gospel album, which would be titled. His Hand and Mine. Released late that year, it stayed on Billboard's top LP chart for 20 weeks, reaching as high as number 13. You may ask me how I know my Lord is real. My Lord is real. You may doubt the things I say and doubt the way I feel the way I feel, but I know he's real today. He'll always be. He'll always be. I can feel his hand in mine, and that's he. At that point in his life, after he became Elvis Presley, the big superstar, he couldn't go worship at church, and he was brought up by his mom to, to be a good Christian young man, and, and, and in, in his mind, that's what he achieved to be. Wherever he went, he would cause a stir, you know, people, get, it would be hard to have a, a normal church service if Elvis was sitting on the front row, you know, so I mean, he couldn't go to church, he couldn't go to the movies, he couldn't go to a mall, and so whatever Elvis needed or wanted, would have to come to him. And I think that's a lot of the reason for the gospel music. And when I would watch him sing uh, with the stamps, and I was around that too, plus at the house, in his mind, that was his worship service. I don't think he understood at the time that he was having a religious experience, but he definitely was at the time that he was singing those gospel songs. He wasn't singing to hear himself sing lead. He was singing because he was, in a sense, he was sort of like, worshiping, you know, with those guys. I really believe that. The major part of his ministerial input came from television and, and TV evangelists. You are loved, and that's the message that Rex and Maud Amy Humbard have shared for more than half a century. Rex was Elvis's favorite preacher. Elvis would always stop when Rex used to preach on Sunday mornings. If we were in a session, around when that time that program came on, we had to stop and listen to Rex Humbard singing. And, and Rex was, and his wife too, was a precious lady. Uh, I, might make, I might want to make mention of that. She was a precious lady and, and we all love them. I've known them all my life, it seems like. And uh, Elvis wanted to hear anything that came out of Rex's mouth. He would take what he had heard on TV through a televangelist and sing a gospel song 
and get the same feeling that others would receive on Sunday morning at the First Baptist Church singing, uh, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. He brought gospel singers and gospel music and played the records and, and listened to you know, the preachers on television. And this was his time of worship and this was his time to recognize some spirituality and to bring that to him. His preaching came from the television. His worship was with those in his living room and his fellowship was with the musicians and employees he considered his extended family. And on those around him, Elvis lavished his love. I think if Elvis had one of his strengths was the fact he had a big heart. One of his weaknesses was his heart was too big. And, and there were people uh, that took advantage of that. There, I mean, I think Elvis, Elvis, a lot of times you hear the stories about where he would like give away a car to someone, a lady that was, he'd be at the Cadillac dealership and he'd give this woman a car or something. Those are the things that he really got off on. Those are the things that really meant a lot to him. If he had a financial problem and he could work it out, he would give you whatever you needed for that. If you had an emotional problem, he would sit with you and he'd read a passage from the Bible and talk to you, help you try to figure out your problem. And if you had a health problem, you know, he would try to work that out. If he had to send you to the best doctors that he could find, he would do that. If you had to have some kind of surgery, he would pay for that. At the end, Elvis had pretty much given away almost everything. And that's, that's why we love him. That's, I think that's, it all boils down to, you know, uh, I think a lot of celebrities, when you find out what they're like, and you're disappointed, and then all of a sudden you don't like their, them or their music anymore. I think Elvis was just the opposite. I think everyone who encountered Elvis, who liked his music once they met him, they loved it more than they ever loved it. He was really a person that you wanted to say, I hope I love this guy. And then when you met him, you, you did. Growing up in a Pentecostal church, he had seen God work powerfully. And he threw himself into his faith as passionately as his music. Who made the mountains? Who made the trees? Who made the rivers? Flow to the sea, then hearses the rain when the earth is dry. Somebody bigger than you and I. Who made the flowers to bloom in the spring? Who made the song? For the robins to sing, then who hung the moon in the starry sky? Somebody bigger than you and I. He likes the way when the road is long. He keeps you calm. And I got into conversation with Elvis just in a, just a regular general conversation. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. And you and how you heard from home, this kind of thing. But he said, uh, uh, you know, my mama went to the, uh, there in Memphis, he said, went to a Pentecostal church down there. And uh, he said, I went to that Pentecostal church. He said, are you Pentecostal? And I said, well, I've attended a Pentecostal church quite a bit. And, uh, but I said, uh, I don't, you know, I've just, I've been kind of Baptist, Baptist churches also. And uh, he said, well, said, uh, I'll tell you what's on my mind. He said, uh, this Holy Spirit thing, you know anything about the Holy Spirit thing? I said, well, what you talking about? I mean, he was just kind of, being, he was just being Elvis, because Elvis was so plain, he just went straight to the juggler, you know, straight to the point. 
and he began to talk about he never felt worthy of this Christian or this type of religion his mother had taught him in the church. And he said, how will I get, how will I know if I get the Holy Spirit or I have the Holy Spirit of God in me? And uh, so Leverson, I don't, I don't quite know that. Uh, I said, God has promised us everything. And as long as we're faithful to him, he'll give us everything we're supposed to have. And when we get it, we'll know it. When we're, we have what we're supposed to have, we'll know it. I said, I think that's infinity. You're talking about infinity. He said, well, I just, I just want my, what my mama had. My mama had something real good. So I kind of thought that was a, a, a simple, maybe a simple statement from him, but a very deep one because he, he was trying to get into this thing of he wanted everything he could from God. He really loved God. He would discuss spiritual ideas with us. And I remember that we were standing in a circle one night and this was in Vegas. And he said, I want you all to close your eyes. And he said, we're gonna, we weren't gonna pray, but he just said, I want you to close your eyes. And I was thinking in my mind, I'll never forget this. I was gonna say, Elvis, what do you think about heaven? I was gonna ask him what he thought about heaven. And I had my eyes closed and he said, Jim, we're gonna get to that in just a moment. And I opened my eyes and, and, he, and I said, to what? He said, you were gonna ask me about heaven, weren't you? And I said, yeah. He said, we'll get that in just a minute. That blew me away. I don't know how, how that happened. Elvis was very spiritual. He uh, believed that he had a certain connection with God, not so much more than anybody else did. But in his search, he was trying to get close to God. So he felt that by helping others, maybe that was his mission. I mean, if you had a family problem, if you were going through, through something, if you were in need of something, and I mean, and he, did, and he heard about it. You know, he, most of the time he'd react to it in some positive way. He frequently read the Bible and often prayed with those around him. One notable example was the evening he learned that Sylvia Shenwell, a member of his background group, The Sweet Inspirations, received news that she had been diagnosed with cancer. We got to Vegas, and one of the girls in the group, Sylvia, had had a um, health problem. She had had the tests, but left before the results. And when she got to Las Vegas, there were um, urgent, emergent, emergency calls from her doctors, get in touch with us as soon as possible. And um, so her test had come back um, with a problem. And so there was some talk that she had had cancer. So after the show, we were all down, and Elvis comes over, as he did every night, to our dressing room to say goodnight. And we're down, and he's asked, he asked why. And we explained to him what the problem was. So he. he took us, the three of us, and we went to the dressing area of our dressing room. And he said, let's pray. And as we prayed, as we, he prayed, he touched Sylvia's stomach and he asked God to move whatever it was. Just take it away. And the next morning when Sylvia reported to Sunrise Hospital there in Las Vegas, they did the test. And it was gone, whatever it was, whether it was a misdiagnosis or whether God had healed Sylvia through Elvis's faith and our faith. I don't know, but we believed and Elvis believed also that God had worked a miracle through him. During the 60s and early 70s, when tensions between blacks and whites were at an all time high, Elvis demonstrated his desire for racial reconciliation in the musicians that he chose and the treatment they received. When we first decided to um, take the gig with Elvis, we had no idea that there would be any racial flack regarding it. Our first racial encounter was when we went to um, Texas, Elvis was told by his people that, well, you can leave the black girls home. You don't have to bring them. 
So Elvis wasn't going to do the Astrodome unless his girls could be with him. And he demanded that we be given the star treatment. We had to be in our convertible where everybody could see us <laughs> and our little blonde could drive us. <laughs> and um, that was his statement. You don't like it? Deal with it or I'm not going to be there. And I thought that was very big of him. When I joined the group uh, in 1972, uh, they took a big chance because there were no blacks in contemporary or Southern gospel uh, music. And I was the first one and it made all the headlines and, and everything. It was in Billboard and all the newspapers in Tennessee. And my first uh, time meeting Elvis was, he had a, a, a folder full of clippings of uh, things that he had read about me. As a matter of fact, the Imperials brought me to his suite and he gave me this folder with all the clippings and he personally welcomed me into the family. And for a guy who, you know, didn't really knew, know where he stood, this was very important uh, that he acknowledged my presence and, you know, made me feel very much a part of what we were all doing. And right away, he treated me like he'd known me for years. He gave me one of those TCB uh, chains and everything, and I was just one of the guys, and, and I never forgot that. And I've been around him with people, other people of color, and I've only seen him give love. He very, was very generous to people that he didn't even know. You didn't have to be of any racial persuasion for him to love you. And you know, they had, you know how rumors get started when there's a big star or something, the people will start rumors, well, he doesn't like this kind of people or he doesn't like those people or that people. And I never...